again, want to welcome those of you that are joining us here in the room or watching online. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Joshua chapter 1 today, Joshua chapter 1. And uh, if you were not here last Sunday, or if you did not catch it online, I cannot encourage you enough to go back and listen to the message that our friend Pastor Greg Ford from One Church in Columbus brought. It was one of the most powerful sermons that I have um, heard in a long time. So helpful um, and was so thankful that our friend was with us. And so if you did not get a chance, it was, it was hard for me in writing this message. And I love the way that God brings things together. It was hard for me in writing this message that was already in the works to not hear Pastor Greg's voice in my head from last week's message. And so if you have not listened to it, I encourage you, Go back to YouTube or Facebook, catch that. You can do it on our website as well, and uh, you will not regret uh, that powerful word, especially if you're in a season um, where you're asking some questions about what's happening in your life. Two weeks ago, we started a whole new series that we're calling Building for Blessing, and there's a, there's a common thread that's running through this series um, for me, for us, as we look at this, and the idea is this, and, and if you weren't with us two weeks ago when we started this series, it, it would be worth going back and and listening to, to that sermon from a couple weeks ago, the, the Building for Blessing one, because we started out by walking through a process and, and this principle that I believe you see specifically in the book of Acts, but it's how God works over and over again in his word and in our lives, that God often does the structural before he does the supernatural. That oftentimes before he does what is fun, he does what is fundamental and foundational in our lives. That if we want to be able to support his blessings, then we have to build in a way so that he can bless us and we can support them. So maybe the best way to say it is God often does the structural. He, he works in our lives to build us up, to prepare us before he does the supernatural. And so we're gonna look at some stories from the book of Acts that back this up, and those will just kind of be a, a launching pad for us to then be able to look at some other biblical stories, biblical examples to consider this process. Uh, let, let, me, let me take you back to Acts chapter two, because Acts chapter two is probably one of the most supernatural passages in all of scripture. It's the day of Pentecost. It's when the church is born. It's when the Holy Spirit falls on the disciples and they speak in other tongues, and there's miraculous things that come out of that moment. It's where the church is launched. If you want to see something supernatural, it's Acts chapter 2. And yet, Acts chapter 1 is structural. It's something that builds them up to prepare them for the blessing that God's going to bring to them in the next chapter. In fact, if you read Acts chapter 1, it's, it's, a, it's all about change. Like the first thing you get is Jesus leaves his disciples. He's, he's gone. He ascends into heaven. And so that's a huge change for them. And then as they're praying, God helps them to see that it's time to change who's in the leadership team. Someone has to replace Judas, which seems like this footnote that you go, why is, why is that important? Because we actually don't hear about this dude Matthias again. Like, it's not like he becomes this major player in the book of Acts. But they have to do this structural work so that they are ready and set up and, and the foundation is set to support the supernatural that God is going to want to bring. What hits me when I read Acts chapter one, and you'll see it again in chapter six here in a couple weeks, you'll see it again in chapter 15 in a few weeks when we get there. What hits me is that all of these instances, and over and over again in scripture, when God is doing something structural, <laughs> this, this is ironic given the announcement we just made, <laughs> when God is doing something structural, he often does it through change. He often changes things. Jesus leaving, huge change. New apostle, big change. Oftentimes when God is doing something structural, he'll do it. God often uses change to do the structural work in our lives. And so this, this is something that we're seeing. You know, we started the, this series by using a construction analogy. And oftentimes when construction is done so that the roads are better, so that places are set to support maybe an influx of people or an influx of business or so that bridges don't fall apart, what it involves for a season, if you are going to have effective construction, it involves some kind of change. It may be uncomfortable. It may take longer than you want. It may be unexpected when you're on your route. But when you get there, you realize, oh, there's change but what needs to be done structural can't happen unless first there's change. So today, what I'd like to do is for us to talk about this idea of change, how it works in our lives, actually how God uses it. 
So let's, let's consider maybe a little theology of change for a couple of moments. One thing that is good for us to see when we talk about change is that God never changes. God never changes. That's good to know, is it not? <laughs> that he is always the same. Look at this, Psalm 55, verse 19. The psalmist says it so clearly. God, who is enthroned from of old, who does not change. So when the weather changes and when situations change and when leadership changes and when people change and when our lives change, when our bodies change, all those changes that may be difficult for us, God does not change. In fact, the book of Hebrews tells us in chapter 13, verse 8, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. That's good to know, is it not? And can I tell you this? One of the things that's important, it's kind of weird when we think about it as the church, we have a message that does not change. And yet there are seasons when we need to view how we do things, who we are, because to communicate a message that does not change, sometimes we have to be willing to change. It's a unique um, kind of dichotomy that you have, almost something ironic that you see in this idea. Because God never changes, but life constantly changes. Anybody found that to be true? <laughs> that God never changes, but life is constantly changing. Things are always changing. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1 says, There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. And then if you've read the book of Ecclesiastes, it's a time to live, a time to die, a time for peace, a time for war. It's all of these transitions and things that are there where you see this change. It says for everything there is a season or we call it April when you get every season, right? I mean, do you, do you remember like two weeks ago, shorts and t-shirts, and then yesterday, four inches of snow? Are you kidding me? Because there's change. We live in kind of a hotbed of change. The seasons change. The, the things around us change. We've lived in a, about 18 months of unbelievable change. Technology changes all the time. It's constant for us to consider this. And it's important that you recognize this because if you don't, it will affect you in so many ways. One of the things that our body is wired for is what's called a circadian rhythm or circadian cycles. And what that means is that there is this natural internal process that regulates sleep and wake cycles, oftentimes that are tied to light and dark, and, and they kind of rotate every 24 hours. So what that means is Based on the cycle of day and night, based on the cycle of what happens, our body needs to adjust to those things so we get rest, so that we sleep, so that we stay healthy. So even the most fundamental things that many of us take for granted, how we navigate the change between light and dark affects so many other things in our lives. How healthy we are, how rested we are, how, how we're able to perform in our lives. So here's what's important to recognize. How you change changes your life. How you handle change that comes your way, whether that's day and night and sleep. Like if you've ever had a, a child at home that's not sleeping well, then you know what happens when this gets upside down. How you navigate those changes changes your life. You might be tired. You might be tired for years. And this is how that works in your life. How you build, and this is not just in your physical life, I think it's true in your spiritual life. It's true in what happens in life. How you change changes your life. How you build on change, how you navigate change, how you handle change, your attitude towards change. When change comes your way, what you do with it, how you manage it, how you capitalize on it, or how you let it negatively affect you are all gonna play into the support you have structurally to then be able to hold the blessings that God wants to bring. So if he wants to do something supernatural in your life, then maybe I need to be open to the fact that he might do something structural first, and sometimes for him to bless me supernaturally, I have to be willing for him to structurally do a work of change in my life. God uses change in our lives. Like it or not, accept it or not, welcome it or not. Oftentimes when change comes, 
Sometimes change of our own making, sometimes change that's unexpected. When that change comes, God uses that change in our lives. So what I wanna show you in these next few moments is take you to Joshua chapter one and give you just one example in scripture. I'm sure we could come up with a bunch of them. In fact, we'll, we'll hit that here in a minute. But, but we're gonna look at one example, Joshua chapter one, of what I wanna talk about as a cycle of change. Because I think that oftentimes in our lives, what we see is that our lives end up, and uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try to make a circle here. It's not too bad, huh? Um, so, and, and understand that oftentimes in our lives, our lives end up in a bit of a cycle that it kind of rotates, that it moves in. And what I wanna talk about today is a cycle of change that often happens in our lives. And we see it really clearly in Joshua chapter one, this cycle of change. Why talk about it? Because if you can recognize it, it will help you. And if you know that it is a thing, then you're less likely to suppress it or fight it or deny it if you recognize this cycle of change that happens in our lives. So Joshua chapter one, verse one. It says, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid. So let's, let's just stop for just a minute. If you're not familiar with the story, Moses, of course, was the great liberator of God's people. He, he was used to lead them out of Egypt where they were slaves and brought them to, to lead them towards the promised land. And you know, they end up wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. And Joshua, who apparently had no parents because he's son of none, <laughs> Joshua was Moses' aide. He, he was Robin and Moses was Batman. And it was told to them that Moses, when he left his position, when he died, Joshua would take his place. And so what you see here is that after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses is aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. That's a fine how do you do, isn't it? No, Joshua, how are you doing? Hey, Josh, thought I'd check in. What's happening over there in Israel? God goes right to Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people, get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give to them, to the Israelites. I'll give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. This really is a fascinating story because for 40 years, they wait for this moment. Whether they realize it or not the whole time, this is a tremendous moment of change. And what gets mapped out here for Joshua is a cycle that you don't just see in these first three verses. I think you see it all throughout the book of Joshua. I think you see it all throughout scripture. I think you'll see it in your life if you look for it. And it's this cycle of change. And it kind of happens, we'll look at it in three phases as we look at this today. So here's the first one. Change phase number one is what we will call transition. Number one is what we will call transition. There is a huge transition. There is a huge change that happens here. Go back to it again. Joshua chapter one, verse one. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses is aid. Moses, my servant, is dead. It's like the code word. It's like, okay, Joshua, this is it. Here's the change. It's time. Things aren't the way they used to be. They'll never go back to how they were. You, you can't undo this one. In fact, now it's time for you to step up and, and step into this calling. Moses is dead. It's an incredible moment of change. Change doesn't always come this dramatically. Sometimes change comes with death and loss, and change comes to us all. Sometimes it's dramatic in this way. Sometimes it's just little things. Sometimes it's a lot of little things. Change comes in seasons. Our lives change based on our families, based on our health, based on our age, based on our jobs, based on our school. We have these different seasons. You'll have a change in your neighbors at some point. You'll have a change in the weather. You'll watch certain businesses open and close. Life will change a lot. Sometimes it's change you hope for. Sometimes it's change you plan for. And sometimes it's uninvited, unwelcome, and unexpected. And your change may be different from someone else's. You might look at a, at a painful change that somebody else is going through, and you might say, well, my change isn't that bad, or I don't have any big changes, but a lot of little changes can start to affect us. Isn't that true? 
And a change is a real change. And it may put you in a place where you're grieving. It may put you in a place where you have uncertainty. It may put you in a place where you're uncomfortable. Don't minimize change because change is real. And one of the things we've got to recognize in this cycle of change is that transition is one of the key cycles in our life. It's a constant. It will happen. You will never be able to not experience change. True? <laughs> So we recognize this idea of transition. So when it comes our way, or maybe when we want to make that change, one of the things that I think is really good is you need to ask the necessity question. To me, you need to ask, is this change necessary? And this question comes in, in kind of two different ways. In one way, you have to ask the, the question, is this change practically necessary? Like from a practical sense, is this something that needs to be done? Let's say you and your spouse live in a one-bedroom apartment, and then you find out that you're expecting your first child. It might be practically necessary to find a bigger place to live. Does that make sense? That's a good change. Like You welcome that change. It might be a hard one. It might be a difficult one. But you recognize from a practical sense, yeah, this is a necessary change. Some of us, it's a good question to ask, because some of us just like change. Like We change things every day. We'd, we'd paint a wall in our house every day if we could, a different color. And you have to ask yourself the question, is that necessary? Like, do you really have to do that? Not that big of a deal. Some of us would move walls in our house every day if we could. And you have to ask yourself the question, is that practical? <laughs> like, do I just like change? Do I just like messing with things? Or is this a necessary change? And one of the things that I think we do is we have a tendency, if we don't like the change, to push against it, and to maybe suppress or even ignore these seasons of transition. Whether Joshua was ready or not, Moses was dead. And change will come our way, and we have to decide what to do about it. Several years back, we were doing construction down on the other end of the building, and we were putting in the, the youth auditorium and the new preschool classrooms and the new kids auditorium. And in the process of that, we had to, to cut some trenches in, not we, like I did it. That's, I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> but our contractor had to cut some trenches into the existing concrete to be able to bring restrooms into the preschool classrooms. So in the process of this, they're, they're doing their thing, they're looking at the plans, they're doing it, and all of a sudden, they hit a major power cable that's running through one of the old auditoriums. And they're like, this is not supposed to be here. <laughs> like that's not, we looked at the plans, we did all this kind of stuff, they're like, it's supposed to be here, but instead, it's there, that's why there's no power on this end of the building, because <laughs> it hit it. Now, we didn't plan for that. We didn't want that. And I couldn't stand there and say to those guys, well, guys, make that not happen. <laughs> like, they're very apologetic, and they're saying, look, we, we had our plans, we did our best, but somehow when the building was built, what should have been here ended up there. So now that's going to change some things. It's going to take us a little longer. And it's going to cost us a little more. It's actually going to be inconvenient for a while. That's the cost of change. And as much as I wanted to stand there and undo it, as much as I wanted to say, well, just don't, just don't hit it, there was no way around it. Change happens sometimes. And then you have to take the steps. You have to be willing to identify the transition that you're in, and sometimes you have to be willing to accept the transition that you're in. Because the longer it takes you to accept it, Sometimes the longer you're stuck here. Does that make sense? Now, here's another side to this. You have to ask, is this change practically necessary? And I think you also ask, is this change personally necessary? Like, honestly, is this change something I need? It might not be something I want. It might not be something I asked for. It might not be something I can even understand. But God, if you've allowed me to be in this place of transition, then can I be willing to accept that maybe there's something you're doing through it? That maybe this change is necessary for me personally to become what you want me to be. Remember last year at one point, we looked at this, this, this quote, this teaching by the author Sam Chand in his book, Leadership Pain. He identifies this interesting process where he says, if you want to grow in your life, and then growth will equal change. If you want to grow, something's got to change. And change always equals loss. 
Because if you're going to change, that means that something gets left behind. And loss will always cause you to experience some pain. Therefore, growth equals pain. You can't have growth in your life unless somewhere you experience some kind of change, which may feel like loss, which may feel like pain. And this is hard for us. This is difficult for us. We don't like to be in this place, but understand that sometimes this place of transition is necessary so that God can do what he wants to do in your life, through your life, for your family, for your church, for your ministry. Like this is key. And when, when we were in the process of um, <clears throat> moving from the church on Glendale down to this location, we spent a significant amount of time walking through the book of Hebrews chapter 11. If you're not familiar with it, Hebrews 11 is story after story after story after story of, of, of people who lived by faith. And we celebrate what God did through the faith in their lives. And as I was reading it, I recognized something. That for Noah, it was a pretty big change to quit his day job and build an ark. For Abraham, getting that U-Haul and going from Ur to some place where he didn't even know where he was going, it's a pretty big change. When Moses did what he did, it was a huge change. And when you read through story after story after story, every one of those involved change. And I realized something, that when God, when God uses someone greatly, he rarely lets them stay where they started. He oftentimes says, for me to do the work that I want to do in your life, it may require that you go through a season of transition and that you be willing to experience change. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody has to leave Toledo. In fact, I read in Hezekiah chapter 6, verse 7, where it says you will do better in Toledo. Anybody else read that? <laughs> right? So like, like it, does, it doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that you have to quit your job. It doesn't mean that you have to do something crazy or unwise. But it does mean that you're willing to say, hey, God, I know that you might have to help me walk through a season of change if I'm going to be and do everything that you've called for me to do. Because when God uses someone greatly, he rarely lets them stay where they started. And here's what I've found in my life. The sooner you identify and accept this phase of transition, the sooner you move forward. Because I can fight this. In fact, you, you might be in a place like that right now where you know there's something going on in your life and you just kind of want to drag your feet. You're just like, I don't, I don't want to do this. I don't want to be a part of this. It might be good. It might be bad. It might be scary. It might be small. I don't know what it is. It could be incredible opportunity or it could be something that you hoped would never happen. But the sooner you go, God, I identify this change and I'm willing to accept it, the sooner it gets us to that second phase that we can look at. Change phase number two is what we will call, we'll look at this here on our cycle of change. We're gonna call this one preparation. Preparation. That this second phase that we see in this cycle of change is preparation. Joshua chapter one, verse two. Here's what we read. Moses, my servant, is dead. There's the transition. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give to them, to the Israelites. These are the two key words right here. God says to Joshua, get ready. Like, there's things I want to do. I want to use you. But I can't do it unless you prepare yourself. This idea of preparation is huge when we're in seasons of change. This is why two weeks ago we looked at this principle, and you'll see it over and over again, that preparation precedes blessing, that before blessing comes in our lives, oftentimes we have to go through a season of preparation. It is a part of change. What might that look like? Well, for you, it might be developing a new skill. Maybe it's learning a language. Maybe it's getting an education. Maybe it's something to do with your relationships. It might be a, a spiritual preparation. Sometimes it's super specific. I need to get this degree before I can do this. I need to go to this place or, or, or introduce myself to this person before I'm able to do this or that. Sometimes it's just general. It's just being in a place of spiritual health. It's your relationship with God. It, it's your personal health. And knowing that you're, that you're fit and you're capable to do these things. 
And oftentimes we find ourselves in this season that when change starts with transition, it leads us into a season where God has us during this season of change in a, in a phase of preparation. How do you do that? How do you make the most out of it? Psalm 33 is an interesting uh, passage of scripture because when you read it, you, you get a sense of times of turmoil, frustration, change. And when the psalmist is, is kind of wrapping things up, th this, this passage actually really struck me. Psalm 33, 21 says, in him, in God, our hearts rejoice for we trust in his holy name. So literally, these people are in a season of transition. They have an enemy, there's difficulty. He mentions famine in this passage, all these things. And yet, he says that we are going to prepare during this season with hearts that rejoice and trust in his holy name. Let me give you a few thoughts if you think you are in kind of a season of preparation right now. One, that, that you do your best to prepare with joy. That you do your best to prepare with joy. Remember, joy and happiness are not the same. You know that, right? <laughs> you might not always be happy in the things you're going through, but God can help you to find joy. And your attitude during times of change can make all the difference. If preparation precedes blessing, then pouting limits blessing. <laughs> preparation precedes it. But if I'm just pouting through the whole thing, I don't want to do this. I don't like it. I, don't, I wish it wasn't here. If your liver is out through the whole thing, then it's actually going to limit and slow down blessing in your life. Look, there are times when change has to happen for the things that are ahead. And the better our attitude, the more joy we can embrace through it, I think the quicker and the better that preparation can happen. Our, our dog, Samson, is a... Uh, 70 some pound golden doodle and uh, 14 years old, my best friend. He has deposited many things in our backyard over the years. So we would use our backyard for things. Like there's times when you gotta mow the grass and there's times when you play wiffle ball. Like we've, we've done all kinds of things back there. And so what happens is before you mow the grass or before you play wiffle ball, someone has to go out and kind of finish the jobs that Samson started. And when our kids were little, we referred to it, I, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this from right here, I'm gonna do it, we referred to it as poop patrol, okay? <laughs> and so when we would say at different times to someone, hey, you're on poop patrol, you know, right now, typically what you would get be, oh, I don't want to. And the, the length of time that poop patrol took often had to do with why you were doing it. If poop patrol needed done because the grass needed mowed, it could take upwards of a week to get it done, right? <laughs> because you're just, I don't want to be out here. I don't want to do this, and this is nasty. But if it was, hey, somebody needs to do the patrol job because we're going to play wiffle ball out there, the job would get done quick because there was something better on the other side of it. Does that make sense? Oftentimes, when I look at change, and especially the season of preparation, I go, this is like poop patrol. <laughs> and I don't want to do this. And in a moment when we get to this part of the cycle, you'll realize that this is so key, not just because there's another job that needs done, but because there's wiffle ball on the other side of this thing. Like there's something that is there. Your attitude makes all the difference. So you prepare with joy. You also prepare with trust, right? That passage in Psalm 33 said that we rejoice in him and we put our trust in the Lord. God can be trusted. And I've looked at this so many times in scripture the difference between when God asks someone to do something that requires change and when they receive blessing and when they don't is whether or not they trust him. Like if you're in, the, in, a, in a season of change, are you willing to say, God, I don't get it. God, I don't like it. God, I don't understand it. God, I, I didn't want to be here. But I trust you because I believe that there's something that you're up to and I really believe this, that especially this, this preparation idea, the more diligent you are in this phase, the more fruitful you can be in the others. The more diligent you'll be here in this preparation phase with your attitude, with your willingness, with your heart to say, God, what do you want to do through this season? I, I didn't want to be in this season, God, but I'm here, so what do you want to do through it? The more diligent you'll be here, then when you're in these other phases, I think the more fruitful you can be. 
So we prepare with joy, we prepare with trust. Let me take you to one more real quick, that you prepare with character. Because if you say, well, Chad, I, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I don't know how I'm supposed to prepare. I just know I'm in a season of change. I just know something's going on. What do I do? In fact, for some of us, if we're in a season of change, we're quick to go, well, I don't know what to do. And I don't know how to handle this. I'm not a leader. I'm not in charge of anything. In fact, oftentimes we'll look at our own selves and we can be guilty to go, well, I'd like to do something here, but I'm not charismatic. <laughs> like, I don't have those giftings. I don't, I don't know that I can do this. The guy that literally wrote the book on change is a guy named John Cotter from a business perspective. His book, Leading Change, is the classic on change. And I just, I just listened to an interview that he did recently. And, and the interviewer asked him, how does charisma factor into this? Because oftentimes when change happens, we, we look at it and we go, it happened because someone had this gifting of charisma. And what he said actually is that typically change that is effective comes from people who have worked on doing things the right way and then because things happen the right way, other people project charisma onto them, not because it was their charisma that made that happen. So if you want to be effective in change, the key is not for you to be larger than life. The key is for you to have your life together and to be a person of character. See, it's character and not charisma that leads to healthy change in our lives. And where does that start? <laughs> I think it starts by saying, God, I need you. Lord, I need you to, to do your work. And I might not understand this, but I rejoice to know that you're with me. And God, I trust you in this. So will you help me to develop the character to be the person that you want me to be so that as I prepare through this transition, then I can get to the third phase in this cycle. Let's, let's go back to Joshua chapter one, verse three. Moses is dead. So God says, get ready, and then he says this, I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. What he says to Joshua is he says, I'm gonna take you through a process. There's gonna be a cycle that you have to get through, and it's transition and preparation, and then the third part of this is blessing. That's when he's able to pour out his blessing into our lives. That process of transition, preparation, and blessing. Let me, let me read with you more about this blessing. J uh, Joshua chapter one, verse three again. God says, I will give you every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the Mediterranean Sea in the West. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. And as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give to them. God spends far more time talking about blessing than he does the transition and preparation. Did you notice that? <laughs> and his desire is that you go through this cycle so that you can get to a place where you find blessing. The whole idea behind this change is that you are building for blessing and what God wants to do in and through your life. Here's what I want you to understand. Change is the bridge to blessing. <laughs> and if you wanna get to blessing in your life, oftentimes that's what we have to go through. There's some change we wouldn't fight. If I told you that we wanted to help you to change things, that tomorrow your employer is gonna double your salary, would you be okay with that change? There are so many things that would be good changes that, that we wouldn't fight. We, we want those things. And change is often the bridge to blessing so that we can welcome this. This is where I'd encourage you, if you didn't listen to Pastor Greg's message, go back and listen to that from last week because he helps us to unpack this. And if you're in this place where you feel like you're in this cycle and maybe you're more over here and you're not over here yet, pay attention to what God says to Joshua. And he tells him, you be strong and courageous because I am with you and I'm not gonna leave you and I'm not gonna forsake you. And I know for some of you, as I talk about change, you're like, ah, it sounds like some kind of leadership talk or it sounds like pie in the sky or this joker's making it all too easy because the change I'm in the middle of right now is really tough and I don't see the blessing and I don't know how this is gonna go you gotta remember that when God says this to Joshua, Joshua is standing on the edge of a promised land that is inhabited by pagans who are bigger and stronger and more scary than they are. 
He's about to step into a challenge that his friends 40 years before said, there is no way we can do this. It had to be a change moment where he had to ask questions about his capability. He had to ask questions about their possibilities. He had to wonder how this was gonna go. And God said, Joshua, here's what I'm gonna do. This is the season where it's ready to happen. I want you to get ready, because what I'm gonna do is gonna amaze you. So you be strong and courageous, and you hang in there, because I am right there with you every step of the way. And look, some of you have seen this. You've watched this in your life, whether because of your, your age, whether because of your, your own decisions, whether because of the hard work, you would say, hey, Chad, I've actually seen this in my life. I've been through this cycle. Can I warn you about something? Do not park in your blessing. <laughs> like, don't, don't get to this part in the cycle and then think it's done. Because the reality is, life is a cycle, and just about the time you think things aren't gonna change, they're gonna change again. Anybody? Just about the time you think things aren't gonna change, they're gonna change again. Anybody? Help me out here. <laughs> right, you're gonna see that, you're gonna experience that. So what, what's really dangerous is for me to park down here and think I've arrived, or think I'm in the spot, or think I'm in that right place, because when we get tempted to think that, we miss out. Sometimes we get down here and we're like, finally, blessing. And it's okay to rest in your blessing. And I'm not saying that this change is gonna take away your blessing. I wanna tell you what God usually does is he wants to build on your blessing. And when you go back into another season of change, when that transition happens, and can I tell you, I don't, I don't think this just happens in this order. You may be all over this cycle at the same time. Anybody? <laughs> your job might be transition, but your family might be in blessing. And I think you're constantly in preparation for the things that God wants to do in your life. And the reason he does that is because he wants to build blessing on blessing on blessing on blessing in your life. It, it, you could call it a cycle. It might be more of a flywheel of blessing that God does in our lives. Watch what he says, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are stagnant and still in his glorious image. Is that what it says? No, there it is. <laughs> We're more and more like him as we are, anybody help me, <laughs> changed into his glorious image. See, God is constantly in a process of working these things out in our lives. Why? Well, watch this. Look at this in the English Standard Version. It says, and we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. The King James Version says that we go from glory to glory. See, God wants to take you from blessing to blessing, but the way he might do it is through this cycle of change. It is a constant cycle. And can I tell you this? If you've not experienced any change in your life, it may be that you're stuck. It may be that you're not open to what God wants to do. It may be that you've said, God, I've had enough glory, I'm done. The reality is he wants to help us walk through this. And can I beg you to do it? Because today's change creates tomorrow's blessings. The change you're willing to walk through today will create blessings for you and for your family and for your community and for your church in the years to come. If you didn't have the privilege of knowing him, let me introduce you to my friend, Reverend J. Donald McManus. Around here, we call him Brother Mac. This is a picture of Brother Mac and me and some guy photobombing us at Olive Garden about 10 years ago. <laughs> Brother Mac, for over 23 years, served as the pastor of this church. And uh, the church was about two or three years old when he came to be the pastor in the mid-50s. The church was in a building on the east side. And Brother Mac bought into the vision that the church had all along. He says, there's too many lost people in Toledo. How do we go about reaching more? And strategically, they prayed and asked the Lord what he would have for them to do, and they moved from East Toledo to, to a, a spot at Burn and Glendale, across from Southland. You guys know where I'm talking about? That was a happening place in that season of time. And they moved the church there, and the church and the school grew there, and incredible opportunities, and the church grew there. And then Brother Max said, how, how can we be more effective, God? What would you have us to do? And then they bought a mile and a half down on Glendale at Glendale and Reynolds. Anybody remember that spot? 1976. And then in 1984, the, the, the church built that building that was there. 
And what I'm so thankful for in the life of this church was leaders like Brother Mac, who over and over again were willing to say, God, what do you want for us to do? How can we be more effective? How can we see more of your blessing? And God said, oh, I've got so much blessing for you. I've got so many things I want to do through your lives. I've got so many ways in which I want to pour out my blessing on your church. Guess what I need you to do? I need you to be willing to change. I need you to be willing to walk through this, this season, these cycles, to be willing to say, God, we'll do what it takes so that today's change will build tomorrow's blessing. I'm so thankful for Brother Mac because the blessing that I've known as Calvary's pastor and the blessing that you know when you sit in these seats or when you watch online, the blessing that missionaries know because of your faithfulness and giving and the way that they're blessed, the blessing that ministries here in our community know because of people and resources from Calvary, the blessing that we can't even begin to counter understand that God has used in this church from glory to glory goes back to a group of people who are willing to say, okay, God, we'll be willing to change today to accomplish tomorrow's blessings. And maybe nobody did that for you. Maybe you haven't seen that in your life or in your family or in your business. I would say to you, then you start this cycle and let us keep this cycle. Be a brother Mac and be willing to say, God, how do you want to use me? I have felt really strongly that this series is important for a lot of people. And we're gonna talk about building for blessing. Change, honestly, is not a fun topic for a lot of us because it's something we don't like. The reality is if you're not in it, it's probably around the corner. Why stress this? Because I want you to build for blessing. Change will happen and I don't want you to miss it. In Honduras, they built a bridge. In the early 1990s, they came up with a bridge like no other. It's called the Chuluteca Bridge. An engineer said, we want to build this thing so that it will withstand hurricanes. And they built an amazing bridge. And in 1998, when Hurricane Mitch hit Central America, that bridge that they had built did not waver. It was not uh, compromised, its structure held. There was one problem though. Here's a picture of the Choluteca Bridge. This is the bridge. And when the hurricane hit, it did such damage and did such unique things that the actual course of the river changed. And now you have a bridge <laughs> over nothing. Strong bridge. That bridge is steady and it is stable <laughs> and it's worthless because it was not able to handle, to accept, to identify, to live with a changing world around it. And whether you like it or not, our culture's changing. Whether you like it or not, our world is changing. And whether you like it or not, there's gonna be a knock on your door or an email in your inbox or a conversation with a doctor or just seasons of life. Who knows, you might wake up someday and there's five inches on your back porch of snow. Change is coming your way. And I don't want you to look at your life and go, I built a really great life and it's a bridge over nothing. I want you to be able to say, God, in seasons of change, I wanna build for blessing. So if you're in the room, can I ask you to stand with me if you would, please? If you're watching online, I'd encourage you, if you want to stand as well, to join us. We're going to go back to that song we sang a few moments ago. And he's the way maker, miracle worker. And look, you were built for blessing. And I don't know what you're walking through right now. I don't know what season your life is in. I don't know what's going on around you. But I do know this, that there is a God who is with you. And you can be strong and courageous. And he is the way maker. He is the miracle worker. And at whatever season of transition, preparation, or blessing you might be in, or you might be in all of them, and it might be working in your life, that he is a God who is with you. And he is working through this change. And he is working in your life to bring a blessing to you and others around you. And today's change is building a blessing that's going to impact people for years to come in eternity.
So can I ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me for a moment, if you would, please? And before we even sing this song, I guess I'd ask this question. If, you, if you're watching online, if you're watching on TV, if you're listening to this podcast, or if, if you're, you're standing here in this room and you would say, God, I find myself in a tough season of change right now. If that's you, would you just raise your hand right where you're at? It's a season of change. You don't know that you understand it. You're not even sure what's going on, but you would say, God, I give this to you. Anybody else? Yeah. Even at home, raise your hand. Just say, God, this is between you and God. God, I'm in a season of change right now. I need your help. I need you to help me build for blessing. Lord, in this moment, we, we rest in you. God, in this moment, we put our confidence in you. Lord, we know that even though we don't see it or understand it, you are working. And so in this time of change, we put our trust, we put our confidence in you. As we sing this song, we do more than just recite words. We make it our prayer. Waymaker, would you be at work on our behalves? Lord, would you use this change to build for blessing in our lives? In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing this song as a prayer together. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. So God, would you help us to be strong and courageous? Lord, whether we feel we're in a time of transition or preparation or blessing, Lord, would we be reminded that you are working on our behalf, that you are accomplishing your will, your purpose, that we would be willing to see change, not as something that takes away, but as a way for you to build something structural in us so that your supernatural blessings can be received and can flow through us to impact the world around us. God, thanks for your word that speaks to our hearts. Thanks for the way that you challenge us. Lord, would you help us to go from here with your special favor and with your wonderful peace? We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.